Welcome back, everybody. We're now going to go and begin Chapter 5, Entering the Social World, Social-Emotional Development in Infancy and Early Childhood. So in this chapter, we're going to begin the origins of relationships, social development. How do we make these bonds and what is our first um, social relationship and how do we develop these relationships as we go further? So what do you think is our first social relationship? The infant and the parent, right? Whoever the primary caregiver is. It's filled with a lot of emotion, happiness, satisfaction, anger, guilt, just a few to name, right? We have a lot of emotions going through us. How does this develop? The next part of the um, chapter will look at how children express different emotions and how they recognize other emotions. So it's one thing to be able to express yourself, right? But can when do they begin to understand and the emotions of others and interpret that. And then in the last part of this chapter, we're gonna go over children's social horizons as they expand beyond their parents to include their peers, right? We're gonna to begin to understand how do children form friendships? What does that look like? And does it look different between boys and girls? We're gonna explore gender roles and look at all of that. So. This, this chapter is going to be really interesting. We're going to look at the social and emotional part of development. So let's look at the next slide and look at those objectives. So I want you to think of your closest relationships. Can you think of when they formed, how they formed, what kind of relationship you have with each other, and why they formed? So we're going to explore that. But I want you to visualize that as you go through that. Put a picture to some of these uh, relationships so you can remember what they mean and it has meaning to you. So the first thing we're going to look at is what kinds of social relationships do we form throughout our lives? We have very many different relationships, right? Some are very intense, some are close, some are casual. We're going to look at all those different types. And then what types of emotions are involved in attachment? Right? We have a lot of different emotions and how we form attachment, we're going to go over. And how important are peer relationships in childhood? So look back at your childhood. Remember your first friend? What did you guys have in common? How did you communicate? What was important to you back then? Try to bring back some of those childhood memories. And as we look at uh, these peer relationships, see if you had some of those. And then finally, we're gonna, how does gender shape relationships? Does it matter, um, do boys play differently with other boys and girls play differently with other girls? Do they play with each other? How does those uh, gender shape, those relationships forms? How does gender influence that? We're gonna take a look at that as well. So the first part we're gonna look at in chapter five is beginnings, trust and attachment. So our learning objectives in this part is are what are Erickson's first three stages of psychosocial development? I think that's your attendance question, so pay attention, right? How do infants form emotional attachments to parents? And why is that important? If you don't have an emotional attachment, can you imagine how you would survive? Do you, do you know people that don't have emotional attachments? We're going to um, explore that. And what are the kinds of attachment relationships? So there's not just one type, right? There's different types. So we're going to look at all that. So I want you to think back if you're a parent to when you left your child for the first time or if you babysat or you, you know, you were with a child and the parents left them for the first time and that baby cried, right? Why do you think that your baby cried when you left them with a stranger for the first time? What does that have to do with attachment and relationships? Well, we're going to be exploring that in this chapter, but one of the things we want to remember is, and we're thinking about Erickson, is that trust versus mistrust, right? So a baby's first relationship is the one it has with its mother or father or sometimes another caregiver, caretaker. Whoever is the primary caregiver, it's usually that strongest and um, it's usually the baby's strongest first bond, uh, and it sets the stage for later relationships. So part of the reason why that baby cries, right, is because it's trusted 
a relationship and a bond with that mother or primary caretaker. And it's learning, it's going to be going through learning to trust others. So let's explore and find out what are, how is that baby developing other relationships with, and the one with the, the primary one. Let's, let's delve in a little deeper and look at trust and attachment. So before we delve deeper into trust and attachment, we need to review Erickson's theory. So you remember he has eight stages of development comprised of crisis for psychological growth. And then the first ones we're going to look at are the first three that are going to be pertain to what we're covering now with this uh, relationship social growth. So this table is a good, great study. Again, great study table. Erickson's first three stages of psychosocial development. And we're going to look at, so birth to one year. So we remember that's basic trust versus mistrust. So that's that baby crying, right? Eight months crying because their mom is gone because they trust their mom. They don't know the stranger. It's that mistrust. And the strength is hope. So when they trust them, when they have hope that things are going to go right because they know that I'm going to be fed because my mom brings me my bottle or I'm going to get my diaper changed because my mom changes my diaper when I cry. So your needs are met and that brings you with hope. The second stage of Erickson's uh, psychosocial development is ages one to three. And you're going to want to know the names of these. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. And that begins that will, that willpower, right? So we think about two-year-olds, they start to express their will, right? It's that they realize that if I want something, there's a will, there's a way for me to get it. So I, they start to recognize that I can do things by myself versus um, I don't quite know how to do it and that guilt of uh, when I don't, when they don't do something right. So it's that balance. So that's between one to three. They're developing that, doing things by themselves and then what happens with the consequences of that. And then the third stage is three to six years, and that's initiative versus guilt, and that gives you purpose. So it's how much do I do versus how much should I not do because it's, you know, it's not the right thing. So you can think of that three to six year old and exploring a lot. This is really going to be important when you're making social and emotional relationships, right? How do you, are you going to be rejected? Are you going to say the wrong thing? But it gives you purpose. I have a purpose, a goal. And I have that initiative to achieve it. So we're going to go in depth uh, as we explore this. But remember this table. It's good for studying for the exam. So let's delve into those three early stages of Erickson's psychosocial development. So like we said on the table on the slide prior, stage one is basic trust versus mistrust. So when parents consistently respond to a newborn's needs, he or she develops trust. Like I said, when the baby cries because uh, it's hungry or it cries because its diaper is messy or it cries because, it, you know, it, it's done sleeping and those needs are met in a reasonable time, then that baby's going to develop trust. And if it's not, they're going to develop mistrust. And so that's the first form of attachment. So if they... The, the infant isn't forming a trust situation. It's not going to respond to anybody very well, right? With a proper balance of trust and mistrust, infants develop hope. It's an openness to new experiences while knowing the possibility of danger. And if that's not balanced, babies will have trust issues. So trust issues can start at the infant stage. So, you know, we think about people now that, Think about people in your life that have difficulty trusting people. Again, we're always asking that question. Remember in development, it's not just where you're at right now in your life. It's what stages have you gone through your whole life? And that includes infant. So it'd be interesting to see what kind of childhood they had. Did they have uh, parents that were really attentive and that balanced that trust and mistrust issues? Or were they um, not balanced and they have trust issues stemming from there? Now, not all adults have you know trust issues stemming from infants but it's interesting to see that research has shown that it can actually start in this stage one so stage two is autonomy versus shame and doubt and again remember that's one to three years old 
And that's understanding that a child can control his or her action. And that's the autonomy. So, right, so they begin to realize that, oh, if I want a cookie, I could go up to that cookie jar and take it. But it's counteracted with doubt and shame. But my mom told me I couldn't have a cookie. Now, I know I can do it. That's the autonomy. But should I do it? That's the doubt and shame. So it's under, they're starting to get that balance. So you're going to notice that first, right? A lot of maybe 18 months, two, two year olds, they don't have that good balance. They tend to do what they want and they have to be taught, right? That, you know, with that comes responsibility. <laughs> and as they get three or uh, closer to three, then they start to understand that a little bit more. And you're going to see this from failure. They, they're going to learn. And this is a definitely a, a stage where they're striving for independence. So they need to go through this autonomy and have some doubt and shame. So they learn, right, how to properly engage with the world. They need to fail to succeed. So just remember that the blend of autonomy, shame, and doubt leads to will. It's that will of wanting to do something. And knowledge that children can interact intentionally on their environment so that they start to realize that they can actually affect the environment. They can, they are actually have ideas and thoughts and what they do can actually affect others in the environment. So it's the beginning of that will that I want to do something, right? Two-year-olds, what is it about? Me, 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 I can do this. So that's when that begins is that blend of autonomy, shame, and doubt leads to will. So remember that key word is will. And then stage three is initiative versus guilt. So initiative conflicts with guilt. One's initiative may clash with the goals of others. So this is beginning to realize that what I want may not be what you want. So I want to take that ball and bounce it over here. But the three other kids playing over there may want to play too. And uh, I... My initiative is clashing with theirs because I just want to bounce it by myself. So that's the beginning of initiative conflicts with guilt. So my my goals don't align with those other kids. And it starts to uh, result in conflict. So it results, but this stage results in purpose. And then if you have the balance between individual initiative and willingness to cooperate with others. So that's that first stage where you realize, okay. I have these goals. Wait, they have different goals. Can I listen and see what their goals are? Oh, that's not too bad. Maybe I do want to play with them too. That would be funner. So I, the balance of this, and as you, you know, uh, meet this crisis and you develop through it and go to the next stage, you're going to realize is the willingness to cooperate with others. So early on, you're going to see maybe a lot of initiative clashing with other goals. You can see that in those three to six year olds, they have a hard time compromising, maybe working with others. But as they progress through these crises and work it out, you're going to see them have more willingness to cooperate. So visualize those three to six year olds. So I want you to picture in stage three, you want to picture preschoolers starting to explore their world. So what happens when they explore their environment on their own? They're going to start asking questions about their world. And they're going to start imagining possibilities for themselves. So they're going to start developing initiative. That's how they start to develop in this stage three. Explore their environment, ask questions, imagine possibilities for themselves, develop a person, a purpose. And then once they develop that initiative and purpose, then it's assessing how it aligns with others. So it's beginning to see that, do I align with other people's goals or do I clash? And as they progress through this stage, that balance will be them able to seeing someone else's point of view and compromising. So just remember, this is that preschooler's age of asking questions and exploring their environment, imagining all the possibilities for themselves to develop an initiative, a plan, a goal, and then deciding if that goal clashes or is in the line with others, and if not, can they compromise?
So we talked about Erickson's first three stages. So we talked about that infant attachment, right? Admit, trust and mistrust, the first year. And then we talked about autonomy versus shame. And that's the beginning of will. And then and that's one to three years. And then we talked about initiative versus guilt. And that's three to six. And that's that exploring and finding purpose and in deciding if your goals align with others. So you're seeing that progression of, I trust you. I start to realize I have a will. I can do things in the environment. I start to then explore my environment, start to come up with ideas and then goals and realize, oh, other people have goals too. And do we have the same goals or do we clash and can we work together? So that's kind of those first three stages coming together for Erickson. That's how they start to develop those psychosocial um, skills. So now this part, we're going to figure out, okay, so now we're starting to how we develop the social, psychosocial skills, but how do we de develop the attachment? So there is a psychologist, Bobley, who found that um, children form an attachment. So remember, attachment is a close socio-emotional relationship with an adult are more likely to survive. So that makes total sense, right? We talked about everything in our body, right? We have the moral reflex physiologically to cling to our mother to survive. That's a, that is a reflex that is for survival. We have all these other reflexes to eat, right? The rooting and the sucking reflex. We have a trust, mistrust, right? To, to figure out who are the ones that we can trust to provide us with food and nourishment. So his theory is that we have these um that if you can develop these relationships as trust and mistrust and these attachments right then someone's going to care for you and make sure you're fed cleaned you have uh correct development you're more likely to survive makes sense if you do not have an attachment like that you know you're probably not going to get your basic needs your feeding your changing the the stimulus you need to develop you're probably less likely to you know to survive or thrive so it makes sense. So he developed four phases in this growth of attachment. So it doesn't just come naturally. Uh, you have phases that you need to go to to strengthen your attachment. So we're going to look at that. So the first one is a pre-attachment, and that's birth to six weeks. So we talked a lot about this. What happens in the first you know, few months of life? That baby is dependent on that caretaker for everything. So they need a and they're forming that trust and mistrust. So they have physiological reflexes and ability to recognize their caregivers so that they can survive. So he's saying this pre-attachment, birth to six weeks, an infant recognizes the mother's smell and sound. So if they know who the mother, because the mother, you know, has the um, food, breast, if they're breastfeeding especially, right? That's, that's, uh, instinctively they know that the mother has the food so they're going to infant they're going to recognize the mother's smell and sound and the behavior elicits caregiving from adults cry smiles etc so their behavior so when they smile or cry that's how they communicate right that's the first forms of communication and they're getting that basic attachment so that they can survive and for for them to know who the correct person is to attach to they recognize that mother's smell and sound because she's going to provide nourishment and that's the biggest thing to survive in the first few weeks so we have that innately in us to form that first attachment so you can imagine if a baby doesn't have that think of those orphanages or people that just you know poor parenting that don't have those attachments that already uh, in the first weeks of life not forming attachments and not feeling that trust so you can imagine how their development would be slowed or hindered as they as they age so that's the first one pre-attachment and just think of it as that innate instinct to survive smell their moms they know their mom's smell and sound because mom has the food and they get that their behavior to communicate is crying last smiles etc so that they get that caregiving from the adult so that tells the caregiver you're doing the right thing or i need you to fix something so the next slide, we'll look at the second phase. And remember, in this pre-attachment phase, it's an interactive system, and it forms attachment relationships. Baby gets response from his actions, um, 
and the parent gives holding baby, you know, feeding baby. Um, and just remember, it's usually the mother, but it doesn't have to be. It can still be the primary caregiver. So the second phase in attachment is attachment in the making. So this is six to eight weeks to six to eight months. And during this phase, attachment in the making, the infant's going to interact more with the caregiver, and they're going to begin to identify the primary caregiver. So with this attachment in the making, you're going to find that, and think about babies that you've had. So whoever is the primary caregiver, maybe the mother, the father, or the grandparent, they're usually, that infant's usually consoled easier with the primary caregiver. Um, they depend, they're less anxious or stressed. They relax, they can calm them down. They smile more often. So you, they start to begin to identify because that's, they've established, that's my trusted person. So they relax and they, they realize that, oh, I'm going to be, you know, good things are going to happen when I'm with this primary caregiver. So um, unless the primary caregiver is anxious or stressed, the baby will feel that. So you can imagine if the mom is an anxious or stressed mom, the baby's going to feel that when that primary caregiver is around, they're going to feel that that tension as well. So the behavior is going to reflect a lot on how that primary caregiver, the mom or whatnot, acts. So, so remember, if the if you're having a difficult a baby that's difficult, you know, crying a lot or seems stressed and anxious, look at that primary caregiver, that parent, and see what's going on in their lives. Is maybe they're stressed, they're anxious, they're not getting the support they need, and it's reflecting on the infant because that's all they know. They only know the relationship. So if they're having a positive, consoled, easily. Um, smooth relationship with the primary caregiver, it's going to show in the infant. If it's the if the primary caregiver is stressed or anxious and, and not able to attend to the baby with, you know, smiles and, you know, soothing and stuff, they're going to feel that anxiety as well. And they're going to show it in their behavior, right? Be fussy, not easily consoled, crying. So that attachment in the making is that realizing and identifying that primary caregiver, interacting more with it, and starting to kind of mirror the uh, the actions of that primary caregiver. The next phase is of attachment is true attachment, and that is six to eight months to eighteen months, and that's when they single out the attachment figure and show her trust. So again, it's usually the mother, but it can be anybody who's the primary caregiver and that becomes their most stable social um, emotional base so that's when they have you know that stranger danger that's why when we talked about earlier why they cry when you take them away from their secure base you're their secure base you're the only thing in life that is the most trusted thing to them that primary caregiver um, usually a mother but can be um, whoever's a primary that is what that is true to them that is the true secure base so when they're there, they feel trusted and safe. And when they're taken away, so like with a stranger, they lose that and they cry. So that's true attachment. That's when you know they really have an attachment is when they are away from their secure base. They um, show behavior that, you know, shows that they're uh, by crying or, you know, isolating themselves, not going to that stranger that they're showing that they don't trust the new environment. And that's six to eight to 18 months. So if you're noticing your child that, oh, they go to anybody. And then about his eight months, six, to eight months. And you're like, they stopped going to anybody because they formed a true attachment to their um, primary caregiver. And it can be more, you know, than one. Um, you know, you could be, if there's, t if there's more, you know, like both mother and father have equal share, you know, they can have a, uh, a, uh, secure base with both of them, but it just tends to be with one more than anybody. You have some that are pretty strong, but one tends to be the strongest just because they see that one as their primary uh, support. So you think of true attachment, think of secure base and the stranger danger. That's, that's attachment. That's phase three. And then the fourth phase is reciprocal relationships. So that just means that we have a back and forth and that's 18 months on. So that's when they can start to actually start initiating interactions and understand feelings of other people that, 
you know, when they're talking to mom and dad, they can realize, you know, that mom has feelings and dad has feelings. They can be sad. They have goals. They have wants too. And remember that 18 months is that magical age where we have what, that, you know, that recognition of self, that uh, increased cognitive, you begin language skills. Uh, you know, think of the beginning of the theory of the mind, they can know the dot in the mirror. So 18 months is a magical age of, you know, self-reflection or realization. And same thing in attachment. They're able to initiate interactions, understand the parents' feelings and goals because they have increased cognition and they can begin to have language skills. So we think about when you can communicate your needs, how much more you understand what you're saying you understand your needs you can start to understand the needs of others so those are the four phases of attachment remember you have pre-attachment and that's the basic you know birth is about six to eight weeks that's that basic you know can smell the mom uh, or the caregiver you know smell them know them so they can survive to eat right and you give behaviors uh the baby gives behaviors of laughing crying um, smiling to to get that uh, attention from the caregiver Second one is attachment in the making. That's when they're starting to identify who's going to be their primary caregiver. Um, they smile more to them. They go, they're consoled easier by them. And again, remember, if that primary caregiver is uh, anxious or stressed, some of that can reflect on the baby. They can get anxious and stressed and be a more irritable infant. And stage three is true attachment, six to eight months to 18 months, and just think secure base, stranger danger. And four is when they can start making reciprocal relationships. They begin to understand their uh, needs and they begin to understand that parents have feelings and goals as well. Increased cognition, increased language. So those are the four phases of growth attachment. You will definitely need to know this for the exam. You will definitely need to know who, who it is, Bal Balsby. And you're definitely going to need to know the time and the, different, the differences between them. So remember what I talked about earlier, that infants usually develop an attachment first with the mother, since just as a whole, they tend to be the primary caregiver. Again, if the father or a grandparent or somebody else was, then they'd be that primary caregiver. But as a whole, it's usually still the mother. Uh, but soon after, attachment begins with the father. And what I want you to get here is that the attachment with the father usually initiates with physical play. So to think about when you, you were a child or you, if you have children, what, did, what were your roles of your mother and father? Was the mother, did your mother primarily take care of all the household stuff, take care of you, and then when your dad was with you, he got to do some of the fun stuff? <laughs> um, it's kind of been how they've seen development and attachment. Now granted, like I said, it's changing as roles become more equal. But still as a general assumption and a general trend that they see that infants usually play more than take care of the children. Mothers read quite, they play quiet games, they talk, they play with toys. When the infant is smaller, um, they share a lot of roles, the father and the, the mother. But as the child starts to develop and can start initiating more, the father usually initiates physical play and the mother usually does quiet talking and quiet games like that. And then the this difference that you want to remember is that while many infants prefer play with the father, they turn to the mother when they're upset. So when they need consoling, think back when we learned about attachments, right? They're looking for that secure base and that primary caregiver, and that tends just to be the mother. So it goes right back to that trust issue. So when they need to be consoled, they go back to the secure base, back to the the primary caregiver, which just generally it is still the mother, as though, although as we're seeing in trend, as more women and men share duties, that is becoming less of, um, of the trend, but still as a, overall, it is still the majority. So now that we understand the four phases of attachment, Let's ask the question, well, how did they come with that? How did they determine that those are the four stages? This table 5.2, Sequence of Events in the Strange Situation, is a study that, that helped them determine how infants, how we develop attachment. 
So we're going to go over the results of this study, but I want you to kind of understand what the study entailed and what they were looking at. So if you can, if you see the first one, the first step was an observer shows the experiment, experimental room. So there's a room that they go into to the mother and the infant and then leaves the room. So you have this room, the mom and the infant are in there. So the infant feels secure, right? The infant is allowed to explore in the playroom for three minutes. The mother watches but does not participate. So she's just a bystander. So the infant's allowed to do whatever he wants in the three minutes. The third step is a stranger enters the room. He remains silent for one minute, so doesn't interact with anybody. Then after that one minute, he goes and talks to the baby for a minute and then approaches the baby. The mother leaves unobtrusively, so the mother just sneaks out. All right, so then this is when the stranger comes in. So first he comes in, he doesn't make his present known. And then after about a minute, he goes and talks to the baby. And while that happens, the mother sneaks out. And then step four, the stranger does not play with the baby, but attempts to comfort the baby if necessary. So may talk to it if it's crying or wants its mom, but it doesn't play or, or engage that way, but it may comfort it. So after three minutes that the stranger and the baby are in there, the mother returns, greets, and consoles the baby. When the baby has returned to play, so the baby's calmed down, consoled, and then starts to play again, the mother leaves. But this time, instead of sneaking out, she actually says bye-bye as she leaves. So she's having the child recognize that she's going to be leaving. The stranger then attempts to calm and play with the baby. After three minutes of this activity, the mother returns and the stranger leaves. So that's the experiment. So what we're going to look on at the next slide is, okay, what did they find? What did they observe when they did this experiment on different infants? So we're going to look at that and digest it a little bit. So what they determined from this experiment is that you can have different levels of attachment. So that's why they call it the growth of attachment. So what they found was in the, the most stable form of attachment, the secure attachment, Remember, this is all, all this um, information is relating to that specific study I just went over in the slide before. So when, the, when the, um, the baby might cry, might not cry when the mother leaves the room, but wants to be with her when she returns. So what happens is that they don't, the, the child, remember the mom sneaks out the first time and that baby probably doesn't, maybe doesn't even realize the mom's gone, but when they when the mom returns they're very aware and wants to be with her so they're very secure because they think the mom is there and um they're very secure in their actions so they don't even know when they go but when they realize she had left and she's back they're like oh i need to get back to my secure base so 60 to 65 percent of american babies display this and that's secure attachment okay if the baby's crying, say that the baby was crying, it might not cry, but if it is crying, once they see the mom, it stops. So that's secure attachment. Once they see their secure base, so think secure attachment, secure base, they stop crying. The second type of attachment that they saw was avoidant attachment. And what this, what they saw, this is what they observed, so this is the behavior, that the baby does not cry when mother leaves and looks away from her when she returns. So that sounds like avoiding, right? So the baby is kind of indifferent. So it's like, I'm not gonna cry, I don't care if you leave. And you know what, I'm mad at you when you get back. This is a type of insecure attachment. So you wanna know, uh, you're gonna, they're gonna ask you, that you know, the first one's a secure attachment. So one of the questions might be, what's the difference between a secure and ins insecure attachment? So remember, this is an insecure attachment. And it makes sense because there's no security. The baby fat does not feel like that mother is the secure base, right? And 20% of American infants display this. So what I want to re reiterate here is for number one, a secure attachment, this is what the baby might be thinking. I missed you a lot. I'm happy to see you. And now all is good. And then number two, avoidant attachment, this is what the baby might be thinking. You left me again. I always have to take care of myself. I can't depend on you. So that's that's kind of what that avoidant attachment means and what secure attachment means. So we're going to look at two other insecure attachments on the next slide. 
So another type of insecure attachment is called resistant attachment. So again, remember the study, remember the um, experiment they did. So this time, baby is upset when mother leaves, still upset and hard to console when she returns. So if you can imagine that, the baby starts crying when the mother leaves, crying the whole time that the stranger is there. And even when the mom comes back, it's still crying and cannot be consoled. Again, this is type of insecure attachment, right? There's no secure base. 10 to 15% of American babies display this. And then the, the fourth growth attachment, which is the third insecure. So remember, there's three insecure and one secure. And this is called disorganized attachment. So let's go back to that study. So the baby is confused when the mother leaves and returns, doesn't know what's happening, acts in a contraindicated way towards the mother. So it does not understand what is happening. Disoriented, you, could, you may think. So it doesn't know why the mother's leaving, why she's going, what's going on here. Um, disorganized attachment and five to ten percent of american babies display this so as you can see we went down from most common to least common so know that order okay so let's think what would the baby be saying in its little brain when it's um going through this so resistant attachments so these would the baby would be asking these questions why do you do this i need you desperately yet you leave without warning I am so angry. That is resistant attachment. Mad, 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 right? That's what we just want to think. Mad, mad, mad. Why are you doing this to me? I need you, yet you leave me, and I am so angry. So never can get over it. Disorganized attachment, the baby might be saying in their head, what's happening? I want you here, but you left, and now you're back. I just don't know what is going on. So that's that disoriented like, I don't know what's happening. So we've talked a lot about attachment between the parent, primary caregiver, and the infant child. But how does that attachment carry over to peer relationships? So your first relationship is with your parents or your that caregiver. So it, it sets the foundation for how you're going to relate to your peers. So you only know what you've learned, right? So... What they found is as they, re, they look at those four types of attachments, they can predict how they're going to interact with their peers. So let's look at that. So babies with secure attachment interact successfully with their preschool peers because they've learned that they're secure. They have good trust issues, right? They can, uh, they can play, you know, they know that the world is safe and they know that their environment is safe and they know that no matter what happens, their secure base always comes back. There's that solid foundation. They're more stable. They have high quality relationships in adolescence because they start with a stable base. They start with that trust. So they're developing trust at the get-go. So it's easier to develop trust with their peers. And as they continue to develop, it's easier to develop trust with ad their adolescents because they had a stable in attachment as an infant and child where they developed strong trust and they have even found that they are better and more st and stay more stable in romantic relationships so it's so important right we just sometimes we take for granted how much infants and childhood development impacts our later adolescence childhood adulthood and how important that we need to start those secure attachments and bonds early on what they found um, with insecure attachments, uh, they can impact social development as well, right? So what they found is that disorganized attachments, and remember that's the fourth one, five to 10% of the population have it. So not a lot, but still enough, enough that you're going to see this uh, with interaction with people. They found that disorganized attachment is linked with later anxiety, anger, and aggression. They just don't know what's going on. So they never feel secure. They never feel anything. They don't feel anger. They don't feel that because they never have any kind of trust. It's not good nor bad. It's nothing. So they're anxious all the time. Maybe have anger and aggression because 
there is, they don't know how to attach to things. They don't know how to trust. They don't know how to form attachment. So you may know people like this that you're just like, why can't they hold on to friends? Why are they so, you know, anger or have aggression? So, but I want to give you good news. Infants aren't doomed if they don't form a secure attachment, but it definitely interferes with social development. So it's, you can always get help. You can always learn how to overcome some of these initial uh, lack of attachments, but you have to be aware and you have to be able to identify them so that you can address them as you're coming and developing so that you don't become an adult that's anxious, angry, and aggressive, right? So it's very important as as we're learning this that these, if you're going into healthcare or whatever your field, you know, you're going into, and even with our interactions with our friends, family, your children, you know, the impact that you can have and to recognize this so that you can affect positively uh, as you make relationships and you develop. So now we're going to look at what determines quality of attachment. So we talked about, you know, secure and insecure. So let's look at what a quality attachment, and that would be a secure attachment. So secure attachment is most likely when parents respond predictably and appropriately, right? We talked about that trust, forming that secure base, having that, knowing that you're going to have someone there when you need them. Instills trust and confidence in the baby. Babies develop an internal working model. It's set up a set of expectations about parents' availability and responsiveness. So it's one of the most important relationships that you can have is your parent and child because it sets the tone for all your other relationships. So just remember, as they develop this internal working model, when parents respond to babies' needs through their crying, they they set a uh, start to develop that trust, and that they begin to realize that their needs will be met. So they start to to begin to understand. Now this is a continuum, right? As they develop into childhood, but they begin to understand that responses and behavior can prompt social interactions and they become predictable and satisfying so when you have a secure attachment as that child grows and they you know maybe they cry when they're hurt or they you know when they're sad and the parent responds with you know tenderness and and they're predictable and they're consistent then they then that child feels secure and it's satisfying because no matter what they're going through they know they have a stable unit there to help them through it and that's how they begin those social sort of interactions so if they have that good strong parent child they're going to start to look at their peers and trust them as well another thing that influences attachment quality is temperament so just remember that temperament refers to consistent individual differences in behavior that are biologically based and are relatively independent of learning system of values and attitudes. So you remember like how you, the behavior, uh, you know, of your baby, of the babies when they are young and continue, your temperament can continue into adulthood. So fussy babies combined with rigid mothers can lead to insecure attachments. So what does that mean? So when you have a fussy baby, right, that needs a lot of attention, that's crying, and you have a mother that can't adapt, that's very rigid, that say they want their baby to have a sleep schedule and be on that and they won't change it, but that baby cries and cries and cries. The mother wants the baby to adjust to them. And when the baby does it, they can't deal with it. So they become erratic and unpredictable with their responses. And the babies become more likely to form an insecure attachment because the behavior of the mother, because it's rigid, it's erratic because she gets frustrated. She may not do the same thing every time. Uh, and there's no trust. They don't build that trust, that secure base. So what we try to do uh, is identify these fussy babies, you know, when they're, when they're young and teach new mothers parent training to help avoid this. So that to learn strategies, you know, have you heard of like, you know, if your baby's crying, take a step out of the room, calm yourself down, know your temperament and your baby's temperament and try to work on skills that you don't 
aggravate the situation. You want to use that parent training to form these interpersonal relationships so that you are not trying to conform your baby, but you're doing it in a consistent and predictable way and not being erratic or frustrated or taking that, um, that attitude out on your baby because you need your baby to form a secure attachment, the consistent response to, your, uh, to the stimuli. So just remember another thing I want to, want to bring it back to the first chapter. Attachment helps show combined influence of biopsychosocial framework. So let's think of it in that biosocial framework. So remember, that's the biology, psychology, social, and then timing is everything, right? So when you think about that, infants' behavior, smiling, crying, they're of biological origin. Caregiver's response to the infants is a social cultural force. So do we, how do we respond? Are we, you know, do we meet the baby's needs? Do we get frustrated? And secure attachments forms when trust of the caregivers in a in stressful situations. So when the infant or child can trust that the caregiver has it under control, when they don't, that's a psychological force. So attachment is part of that biopsychosocial framework. Let's move on now to emotions. So we have a gamut of emotions, sad, happy, joyous. But what do they really mean? How did we develop them and how? what are the different types this basic and complex let's really dive in and discover the world of emotion so our learning objectives this section is what what age do children to begin to express basic emotions and i want you to think about what do you think is a basic emotion and when do children begin to understand other people's emotions we talked a little bit about that earlier in erickson's stages right and what are complex emotions when do they develop you want to be able to tell the difference between basic and complex, definitely for the exam. And how do children regulate their emotions? So we know a two-year-old is way different than a six-year-old. So how did they be, how are they able to regulate those emotions? We're going to dive a little deeper into that. So let's start off with the basic emotion. So what is a basic emotion? It's experienced by people worldwide. So it's universal no matter where you live or what culture or ethnicity you are. And it consists of subjective feeling, physiological change, and overt behavior. So these are some basic emotions. Joy, everybody can feel joy. Anger, fear, interest, disgust, distress, sadness, and surprise. So that's universal over the world. Newborns experience all of these emotions by eight months. Socially, smiles at two months indicate joy. So babies can start to, it's not just gas anymore. A social smile, as they found on average, is about two months, and that indicates joy. And stranger wariness, which we remember that stranger danger, right, is about six to eight months. And that emerges at approximately six months, and that indicates fear. So that's when they realize that the stranger is different from their primary caregiver. Older infants uh, are angry when they have attempts to achieve a goal and they're frustrated and they, you know, they get upset when they can't get a toy or when a toy doesn't work the way it, it should. So you start to see anger. So think about all the um, emotions in this listed here and think of that child you know, up to two years old. Think of how the gamut of emotions that you see them go through. Another thing to remember is that with the stranger wariness, if a stranger or an adult first talks to the to the um, the child and warms up to the child, or, then they're less likely to show fear. And it usually starts about. Um, it usually can get better when they can have some mobility when so when children can have ability to move away from the the stimulus or the uh, stranger <laughs> crawling creeping that's why you know six months then it gives them um, freedom to get away then they can start to not uh, have as much of that fear so as they get eight nine months but 
it's still there depending on the child and the temperament and their attachment, right? But those are some things that you can see variance if you see variance in a child. And remember also with social smiles that cooing is an early form of vocalization and that's also expressing joy. So now that we've gone over basic emotions, let's take a look at complex emotions. So remember, there's that magic 18 months again. And what do we know about 18 months? It's when the child discovers themselves. It's the understanding of themselves. So it's the magic age and early child development. So they begin to look at um, pride, guilt, embarrassment. They start to understand those feelings. So they must have understanding of self, which is usually around 15 to 18 months, before they can experience complex emotions. So remember, that's that looking, experience sense of self as being able to look in the mirror and realize that that dot, you know, is not on them. So again, here we look at a table. Great way to study. Uh, let's look at infant expressions of emotion. So we got the emotion type, which is the basic. And that's the responses experienced by people worldwide that include a subjective feeling, a physiological response, and an overt behavior. So if I'm experiencing joy, I have, I'm feeling joy. A physiological response would be a smile. And overt behavior might be cooing um, in the infant usually birth to nine months, and happiness, anger, and fear examples. Um, emotion type self-conscious, it's a response to meeting or failing to meet expectations or standards, and that's 18 to 24 months. So remember complex emotions, if you don't see them by 24 months, that's still in the normal range, so 18 to 24 months, and that's pride, guilt, and embarrassment. So, like we've talked about, as a child grows cognitively and socially, the emotions are going to develop when they may not have in the past, right? The more they're exposed to their environment, the more language they have, so the more they can understand people's intentions, their goals, their purpose, and understand their own intentions, goals, and purpose, then they can begin to understand and express their emotions. Language and understanding of self are the huge propeller of these cognitive and social developments. And when they can, the more that they can understand language and the meaning behind that, actions and purpose, the more they can express and understand their emotions. So one example of um, an early fear may be the emotional response to um, fear in the presence of the dark. So as they're, when they're younger, maybe four, five, six, they, you know, they don't have as much cognitive growth, so they're going to have irrational fears. So like their fear of the dark, even though nothing's changed in the dark. But when they get into elementary school, they can reason themselves. They can logically know that there's nothing, you know, nothing has changed in the dark. I've cognitively grown. I have um, I, my, my emotional response to being in the dark has decreased. So that's that cognitive growth. So different cultures favor different emotions, right? We've all grown up in different cultures, ethnicities. They value different things. So how might a culture that values individuality view pride as compared to a culture that values collective groups over the individual? So something to think about. So what they found through studies is that Asians tend to have more emotional restraint. So they don't, so pride is actually perceived as um, it's not, it's not a good thing. So they might be embarrassed by that. Whereas Americans might be very, yes, and very prideful, right? That's very important to show that, uh, that we support you. Very outgoing, very, you know, we give a lot of awards out, right? We are very <laughs> ribbons and awards and stuff where, that in an Asian culture might be shown as an embarrassment that they are they have more emotional restraint and pride is a um, personally looked down upon. Another thing I want you to kind of think about as we as they grow is what happens as they go through the year. So we kind of see that infant phase, but what happens when they get to about five to six years 
of age, they begin to experience regret and relief. And by nine years old, they have both emotions um, appropriately. So they handle regret and they're getting that balance between regret and relief. And like we said, as they increase cognitive growth, so by nine years old, they're like, they're more worldly. They know more about their person, their actual health. They brush their teeth. They take care of their stuff. They shower. They go to school. They understand shame and guilt in new situations that they wouldn't have understood when they were younger. Um, they understand, so they understand like it would be bad if they didn't defend a classmate who was wrongly accused of theft. Whereas when they were four or five, they wouldn't understand that concept that Oh, I don't know. I don't I don't understand the social ramifications. I don't know what's going on. But now at nine years old, they understand that they have the cognitive growth that, you know, I feel guilty if I didn't defend my friend when I know they didn't do it. Um, they can feel that emotion, that higher level emotion. So we've talked about how do we develop emotions, but how do we recognize emotions? Very important, right? Have you, have you ever noticed people that just do not get social cues. Can't tell that you don't, what you're saying is offending them or they didn't catch the clue that, you know, maybe they should stop talking about that. So that's the same thing idea when we're thinking about recognizing people's emotions. Can we tell what mood they are in? Can we tell how they're feeling and respond appropriately? So it begins in infants. Infants can detect emotional facial expressions by four months of age. So they can look at an angry face. They, so what they did is they took, did a study and showed pictures and they looked at an angry face longer than a neutral face. So they knew that that something, you know, was different about that face. They also found when they heard happy sounds, they looked at a happy face. So they were equating they could tell the infant was recognizing that that was something happy, and so they looked at a facial expression that matched it. They also found that infants can also match their emotions to their mothers. They act happy when the mother is smiling and talking. I remember what I talked about earlier about that primary caregiver, if they are anxious and stressed, then they are going to match those emotions as well. And that can turn into anxiety in childhood and adolescence. So remember, infants are looking to you. They're modeling, they're mirroring you. They're learning how to be humans and how to grow up and develop socially, emotionally, psycho psychologically. So you're their mirror. So when they see you acting and responding as their mirror, they're going to mimic you and they're going to learn that. So when it makes sense, they're going to act happy when the mother is smiling and talking and vice versa. And then social referencing, this is one of your questions, I believe, on your attendance assignment, is when infants look to their parents for cues on how to interpret a situation. So maybe they don't understand exactly what's going on. So maybe a stranger comes up and maybe that stranger just kind of looks neutral and they say something to the mom. They're going to see how the mom reacts to know, okay, is this a good situation? Is this something bad? Do I need to be fearful? Can I be happy? And when they see that the mom was like, oh, hi, I haven't seen you. Maybe gives them a hug, they can relax. And they're like, okay, this is a happy experience. So they're, we can be friendly to this person. So they're looking for cues from their parents to know how to interpret a situation. And then they get, they gain the experience of that and they start to build that up in their mind. And then they mimic that with their peer relationship. So parents, you're being watched all the time, right? How many times have you seen your child do exactly what you did and you're horrified <laughs> so uh remember that they're looking at you to learn how to act to, to know what to do in social situations to know if something's safe or unsafe or you know they're cueing how they're putting all that connection together that person looks unhappy they acting unhappy they're being angry so then they're taking those cues so when they as they develop and they see those facial expressions match with the tone of voice then they're knowing to take their, their correct uh, social cue. So in this figure, it's showing that if a parent seems frightened by an unfamiliar object, then babies are also wary or even afraid of it. So they're taking that social cue, right? That's what I was talking, that social referencing. Infants are skilled in using emotions of adults to help them direct their own behavior. They're just looking at you to, 
to teach them what they should do in those situations. So what experience, experiences contribute to children's understanding of emotions? One thing is that parents and children frequently talk about past emotions, why people felt the way they did. They're con making the connection. They're, this is allowing the child to understand why they're feeling those emotions and to understand them. Parents talk about feelings and how they differ. Uh, they have positive rewarding relationships with parents and siblings and that helps children understand emotions. So those are some ways to have experiences that contributes to the understanding of emotion. Uh, if you don't have a good parent-child relationship, you never talk about feelings, you don't talk, you don't, you fight all the time with your siblings, you don't have good um, social cues, you don't have good, you don't argue fairly, you don't have good communication, all those can contribute to your emotions the other way. So all of that, the infant, the child is looking at the environment that they're in, they're looking for the social referencing. They're learning how they should feel uh, as they emotionally and socially interact with the world. So you can imagine if a child that has a uh, does not have those cues, does not have a good parent relationship, does not have good communication, never talks about feelings, what would they look like as a teenager, as a young adult, if they never got any help or never learned about other ways to communicate? Again, we're always looking at the whole picture, the whole development, not just when the person at the present time. It makes that person's life and their behavior seem a, make a lot more sense, right? And then it allows them, you know, even by you looking at this, you may know somebody or maybe even some things that you saw in your childhood. It allows you to think about it. And you can even now change, you know, the way you look at things or maybe the way you want to show your child how to talk or communicate. So all this is plays such a huge part we didn't even think about. I know I didn't think about growing up, but looking back at my childhood, it makes me think about, well, did I have that growing up and how has that affected me now? So think about that as you keep going through this class and we're learning all these things, you know, put it to your, your, how you grew up, how you see your children growing up and how you're progressing in your development. So we've talked about how we develop emotions. We've talked about how we interpret other people's emotions and how we learn uh, by referencing our parental cues with emotions. But how do we regulate emotions? Now, we've all been there, right? You feel so angry that you could, you know, want to explode or, you know, you, but you can't. So, but you know, as an adult, you've found ways to rein in those emotions. And then you've seen a two-year-old who couldn't and throws a tantrum. So how do we get from there to now. Well, let's take a look. Infants begin to regulate emotions by four to six months. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> uh, example is a frightened infant moves away from an object of fear, moves closer to the mother. And again, remember when I talked about that little connection between mobility and easing fear. Then when you have a way out and you're not stuck, then you're less fearful because you know you can move away from the object that's causing you fear. Same thing with language. When you can communicate and know yourself, then you're less likely to be afraid because you can get your uh, point across. By 24 months, uh, the child realizes that a sad facial expression is likely to get a response from parents. Now, how many times have we seen these, the little pal with the quiver and trying to get their way, they're already starting to realize how their emotions can manipulate and affect other people, and especially their parents. So remember, four to six, they, they're, they start the basic uh, regulating of emotion by like almost physio biologically, physically, they move away from the stimulus. As they age, it becomes more cognitive, and they, by 24 months, they can actually manipulate an emotion, an expression, to get an emotional response that they want from their parents. So that's pretty remarkable. And just know that um, as we develop and we begin to regulate our emotions, that we're able to regulate because we have that, that cognitive development. We can begin to understand and reason and talk ourselves down. So let's go over the process of how we get there. So as we get that cognitive development, we find new ways to regulate emotions 
um, as the ch children get older. So first, they rely less on others to regulate their own emotions. So as an infant in the early childhood, you may run to your mom crying or hug yourself. But now they may be be able to calm themselves down. They may be able to entertain themselves by, you know, doing funny faces in the mirror or something that distracts them. They may begin to rely more on themselves than others to regulate their emotions. They use mental strategies to regulate emotions. They match the strategies for regulating the emotion with a particular uh, situation. So they now are able to, you know, wait for it to open a, a, a present till Christmas morning because they have a strategy. Well, you know, they can talk to them. They can talk themselves down. You know, I only have to wait eight hours and then I'll get to open the gifts. And I know that's not too long. Whereas, you know, a one year old, a two year old might want it right now. And they're able to start controlling frustrations. They can maybe, you know, picture that, oh, when I get up on Christmas morning, I'm going to have these wonderful toys. It's going to be so awesome. If I just wait, they can mentally strategize. So they're starting to learn all these productive techniques that we learn when we use as adults and don't even think about it. But what they found is that children who don't regulate their emotions very well, they tend to have adjustment problems and peer difficulties. Makes sense. So if you can't, if your emotions, anger, fear, you know, anxiety, if you can't regulate that, and how are you going to interact with people? How, especially peers, when you're just learning the social interaction, social cues, if you're angry all the time, what do you think one of your peers is going to do? If that kid is throwing their toy and throwing a tantrum all the time, the parents probably got to run away, right? They don't know how to react to that. They're not able to make those attachment with their peers. And then if they don't make the attachment with their peers, it carries on into adolescence and even into adulthood. So it's very important that as adults, as parents, as educators, that we teach children how to regulate and control their emotions so that they can have productive social interaction through adolescence, adulthood, you know, and we need to, as they age, increase cognitive strategies in school age and adolescence um, so that they become effective in regulating their emotions and they can interact appropriately in social situations. So now that we've developed our attachments, we've got our emotions developed and learning to control them appropriately, we're ready to interact with others. So let's talk about how do children first begin to play with one another? Have you ever thought about that? Have you watched children think about your children playing with their friends or when you played? How do they first play with each other? Uh, and how did that develop? And what determines whether children help one another? How does play change during infancy and the preschool years? So we're going to show uh, and talk about how play is basically the environment that children learn their social skills and that why it's so important into the learning process of social and psychological and physical development. So we're going to talk about the joys of play. So play is awesome, right? We all want to be a kid again and play and, you know, have that unrestricted time to just explore. So how do children begin that? Play is the environment where children learn socially and how to interact with their environment and their peers. So I am going to go over some of the play and then I'll have some videos and the supplemental videos showing examples of some of these. So parallel play is the first type of play. It's when each, and you may notice this if you've had children or you've been around children, it's each child plays alone, but is interested in what the other is doing. So they're kind of each playing with their own toy. They may look at the other person playing with the toy, but they never interact and they never share their toys, but they're playing next to each other but not together. That's parallel play. Simple social play is the next type of play. So you kind of, as you develop cognitively, your play becomes more sophisticated. So simple social play is when toddlers engage in similar activities and talk or smile at each other. This begins at about 15 to 18 months, right? That special age when what? We discover ourselves. We know we are ourselves and that we have a will and other people have a will and purpose as well. So this is when, you know, you might see a child. They're both playing, maybe, you know, making um, a castle out of blocks or something. 
and they're looking at each other, they're talking and smiling, and they're adding blocks to the same, you know, arrangement. That's that's simple social play. Now the third one is cooperative play, and it, it play takes on a distinct theme, and children play roles. So this is that imaginative play, you know, role playing. It usually begins around age two. An example would be having tea parties, playing kitchen, playing school. You know, we're at the firehouse. That's that imaginative um, play, and that's so important in forming social, you know, socialization and role taking and turn taking. So it has themes, you know, hide and seek. So you can see each type of play is starting to develop that social interaction. How do we relate to our peers, work with our peers, and cooperate with their peers to take on a general goal. So you can see play is the avenue and they do it in a fun way. So it's how that peers begin their uh, interaction and to form relationships. So just remember that make-believe progresses from concrete to abstract. So basically what objects might a child use to play school? So concrete, you know, they would actually have a ham, I mean, a stapler or a piece of paper. Um, abstract, they may grab, you know, their hairbrush and say, that's my stapler. And then they, because they can imagine that, I'm going to pretend this is my stapler. And then this is your table, your desk at school, which is just really a cardboard box. So they can create objects and they can make it imaginative to like, that symbolizes what would school be like. But it starts concrete to actual having objects. They can't understand if I, you know, took if before they understood, um, like maybe at, you know, a year or something, and I said, this is the, the stapler, they would be like, no, it isn't. It's concrete. It has to be what the object is. They can't understand that yet. They haven't got to that, you know, self awareness and what uh, they are to their environment. So, once they get to that, they can start to realize that, oh, this stuffed animal can symbolize what I'm talking about. So what are the benefits of make-believe? Tons, right? It's fun, for one. Promotes cognitive development. So you're acting out social situations. You're thinking about problem solving. You're, you know, you're mimicking your adults. You're developing a lot of um, thought process and procedural. So definitely cognitive development. It's increasing memory, language, and executive functioning. It's promoting all that. It's just in a make-believe. It's what it's acting like what we adults do, right? But they're putting it on their level. Allows children to explore topics that frighten them. So maybe they could say, you know, they might say, oh, my baby here, she's afraid of the dark, and she doesn't want to sleep alone. Well, that baby could symbolize them, and they're just afraid to talk about it. Or... So it's a way to children to explore topics that might frighten them without having to own them or talk about them, you know, from a personal aspect. And having imaginary friends is linked to children being more social. So this is important to remember. Having imaginary friends is linked to children being more social, especially with the firstborn or only child. Because, right, if you're firstborn, you don't have another child to interact with. And if you're an only child, how do you get that early peer relationship if you don't have another person to communicate with? So they make up a make-believe friend and they actually pretend, you know, use those social skills on that make-believe friend. And it's more sophisticated with people's thoughts, beliefs, and feelings, and it gives them greater self-knowledge. And they also found that pets help too. So again, having someone to interact just having some beginning those social interactions, those conversations, even if they're pretend, they're playing them out in their mind. And so they're developing scenarios, situations, and practicing them. So with make-believe, how do you make make-believe? How do you, you know, do a play activity, which I talked about in last section? How do you do a good play activity for make-believe? You want to start off with realistic props, real cups to drink in if you're doing a tea party, concrete. And then as they develop cognitively, you can do more abstract. You can pretend that stuffed animal is a, is a teacup and your other one is, you know, your other, your bear are your friends. They can all be, you know, getting into drinking your tea. 
Um, you can pretend a stick is a sword, a paper plate is a steering wheel, right? So as they increase in their cognitive abstract development, you can go to that stage. And then parents help with pretend play to make sense of confusing situations at first. So they need to realize they're playing for fun. So they can start up the situation. Oh, let's have a tea party. You know, they can show them what this, the normal tea party is. And then they learn that and then they take it off into their own imaginative play. But they need to have some, you know, make sense of it. Well, what is a tea party? Well, what is, you know, a sword fight? And they learn that another reality has its own set of rules. So they learn that different situations has their own set of rules. And they're making their rules up as they go here. But they're learning that concept of, you know, wherever I go, there's going to be their own set of rules, and I need to respect those rules and understand them. So make-believe is a huge avenue for developing socially, psychologically, and cognitive development from memory, language, and executive functioning. So there are times when a child wants to play by themselves, which is solitary play. So there's good solitary play, which is, you know, when children sometimes just have to entertain themselves. They need to learn to be able to entertain and not, you know, not be, you know, to deal with their boredom, right? In this society, it's so hard, right, with electrical devices and constant feedback and constant gratification, instant gratification. How do you deal with that when you can't have that? So children need to learn how to have solitary play, coloring, doing puzzles, playing with Legos, reading, etc. But with that, there are two types of unhealthy solitary play, and it's important to distinguish the difference. So one type of, sol un of unhealthy solitary play is if you notice wandering, wanderingly, wandering aimlessly. So they're going from one activity to the next. So they can never just sit and play with one thing. They can't focus. They can't have any purposeful play. They're just going from one activity to the next. Another type of unhealthy solitary play is hovering. And that's watching children play, but not engaging with them. So you've seen that child that kind of just sits back, that they don't know how to engage. They may be too shy, too anxious. We don't know their background, like their attachments. Think about all the stuff that we've learned. Why would that child not want to engage? Um, and if this is consistent, the children may need professional help if they engage in these two types of play consistently. And another thing that we've learned, if we can identify these issues early on and teach the child how to, uh, you know, have purposeful play and have good attachments and have good social interaction, then you'll avoid some of the problems that would lead to an adolescent and adulthood. Like I said, it's never too late. There's a whole, you know, I'm sure psychologists see tons of people and delve into these problems full on business, right? But by understanding the way that we play, the way that we develop emotions and attachments is going to help you understand why we do the things when we're eight and 16 and 25 and 85, because it's all started when we were young and an infant. Now that doesn't guarantee that you're going to be like that as an adult, but it's something, it's part of the picture. It's part of the puzzle. So it, it's, it's one part of a whole gamut of things that influences. And, it's, and once you can understand all the different parts, you're gonna understand why I am the way I am and why people develop the way they do. So remember at two to three years of age, children prefer to play with same sex peers. So I talked about this early, earlier on when we asked the questions at the beginning of the lectures, how does it matter, you know, if you're a boy or a girl, how do they start? Do they play with boys? Do they play with girls? So what they found, just as a study, no matter where they've studied this, two to three years of age, children prefer to play with same-sex peers. So boys prefer to play with boys. The girls prefer to play with girls. Children do this on their own spontaneously. Uh, they resist playing with members of the other sex, and they choose to play with members of the same sex, even in gender-neutral activities, you know, like, for example, puzzles. Um, they just want to play with others like them, especially, um, you know, knowing what they know about their own sex. So, as you see this in your own daily life, you put a bunch of boys and girls together, do they gravitate toward each other? You know, it's interesting to see that even spontaneously, 
because they just tend to gravitate towards the girls tend to boys tend to be physical girls tend to be more language just the way that we acquire our skills and we just tend to go towards those same sex they found about two to three years of age so why do children prefer to play with their same sex peers so one of the biggest reasons is that boys and girls styles of play differ do you notice that how do boys play how do girls play you know boys tend to be more physical they prefer competition and girls prefer cooperation girls tend to have better vocab better language skills uh, guys just tend to be more physical girls do not readily influence boys during play so they find that girls typically use enabling actions to support interaction and boys use constricting actions to create competition so girls want to be agreeable and boys want to you know create competition so what they found is that boys would say you know that drawing is stupid my picture is better where girls would say oh what a pretty picture you know what do you want to do now so they're always trying to enable you know trying to be cooperative you know, and boys are com competing so like my drawing's better my picture you know is better so they're they're instilling that competition so boys learn primarily from boys and girls learn prim primarily from girls so that's where they start to establish gender roles so playing and learning from the same sex reinforces these gender differences so they spontaneously go to each other the same and then because of that spontaneous play they develop gender differences as they grow up so it's interesting to see how, as we look at this more in, in the gender roles as we go through this chapter, how that is going to affect as they get older. So how can parents become involved in children's play? So first off, they're gonna be their first playmate, right? They're gonna act as a playmate and help to advance the play. So they're gonna teach them how to play, just like you guys taught all those parents how to play. They're teaching the child how to play, how to interact with you know, the object, the toys, how to interact with another human being, them. So they're going to teach them like make believe and peekaboo and tea parties and pretend play and, you know, all that stuff. So they can advance the play. And then the child is going to use their own imagination as they cognitively develop and mimic some of the things that the parent has played. But they're the first playmate and they're the first one to teach them how to, you know, how to play and interact with their environment. They're going to set up social activities and visits, so they're going to write tea parties, maybe play dates, uh, so they can see how they interact with other adults, how children interact with them. So they set up, they set those up. They coach their children to acquire conflict resolution and decision making skills. And coaching must be constructive for ch children to benefit. So if they're not teaching, you know, po good ways to resolve conflict, it's not going to be a positive. Uh, a benefit so by parents negotiating conflict it helps children learn social skills so remember that scaffolding that we learned back in uh, earlier in the semester so they're going to give a lot of help early on the appropriate amount of help and as the child learns how to socially resolve conflict correctly they're going to back off and let them solve their own problems so the parent's guide is to teach them how to socially interact and make good decisions and interact, you know, appropriately with other people to solve conflict. And as they get better at that skill, they're going to back off and let them become more independent thinkers of it. So they act as that mediator, mediator when children have conflict and they scaffold back as they begin to get more independent. So this is the last part of the um, last slide for the first part of um, chapter five. So I'll have the second part, it'll be a little bit shorter, and then I'll have your supplemental videos on play and um, anything else I think that might be beneficial. And I will see you in the next slide. Take care.